start by presenting you some data about COVID-19 and autoimmunity. The reason is that a lot of um, primary care physicians, they reach out to me to ask questions about um, autoimmunity in COVID, but also they reach out to me to ask me about uh, vaccine, the COVID vaccine. And every single day I have at least four or five messages from patients to ask me if they should get the vaccine, if they should get the vaccine sooner, if the vaccine is safe and so on. Uh, I personally am licensed in uh, uh, five states now. Uh, I added Arizona and uh, very soon I'm gonna add Texas. When it's gonna be possible, I don't know. So let's start talking a little bit about uh, COVID-19 and autoimmunity. Since this is something new to all of us, you all know that initially uh, patients will uh, present in their early stage usually with mild symptoms, uh, fever, dry cough, and a lot of other weird symptoms, like uh, they lost their uh, sense of um, smell or their taste. But shortly after they can get into the stage two, the pulmonary phase where they present with a lot of upper respiratory syndrome and uh, they can develop also, uh, many of them, they can develop hypoxia. And on their imaging studies, you can see a lot of the uh, changes of uh, interstitial pneumonitis, but they can also present with other changes like transaminitis. Um, and uh, if you know patients have other risk factors, unfortunately, some of them, they do progress towards the stage three, which is the hyperinflation phase the most severe phase where uh, many of them, they develop ARDS, um, they can get into shock, cardiac failure, multi-organ uh, multi -organ failure. And uh, unfortunately, many of these people do not survive. And a lot of people try to understand how to stop to get to this um, inflammatory response, exaggerated inflammatory response. And in the beginning of the pandemic, if you remember, there were so many papers published about this. Every single day was a paper published by hypothesis, how to do certain things, how to stop the progression. And they thought that this hyperinflammatory syndrome, it's actually caused by a molecular mimicry of one of the protein of this virus causing autoantibody formation. And if you look at this uh, image, uh, once the virus gets into the alveoli, it's going to produce a lot of inflammation. So it's going to send a lot of signals towards all the uh, cells of our immune system, from dendritic cells to monocytes to macrophages. And then those things will come along and they will start producing a lot of pro pro-inflammatory cytokines, which will produce what we call the cytokine storm. And this is what's happening in that hyperinflammatory state. And at that point, the patient will develop symptoms of ARDS, but many of them, they will progress towards multi-organ failure. And as I said, sometimes they will die. Now, on top of that, uh, they've seen that COVID patients um, do present with some symptoms or some, some signs of autoimmunity. And they reported um, some cases of ITP, they reported uh, cases of Guillain-Barre and um, um, a variant of Guillain-Barre like Miller-Fisher syndrome. And all of these were case reports, were not like studies on, on people with uh, COVID, but they wanted to make people aware about the possibility. Unfortunately, COVID affected kids as well. And uh, although initially they talk about the fact that kids are not affected, some of these kids, especially uh, those cases come from Northern Italy, uh, middle-aged kids develop what we know to be the Kawasaki disease, which is a systemic vasculitis, but it's very severe because it can cause coronary aneurysm. They treated these patients with IVIG and anakinra, and some responded, but some did not. What was very interesting about COVID-19 is the fact that um, a lot of these patients started to, to develop thrombosis, and they've noticed that antiphospholipid uh, antibodies uh, or syndrome was more present in uh, COVID-19 patients. So they basically started to anticoagulate a lot of these uh, patients. 
What they've noticed in severe cases of COVID is that they develop stroke, especially in elderly population, but also in a few young patients between the 30 and 40 years old. They've seen a lot of venous and arterial thrombosis, especially under the age of 50. And sometimes they had patients with catastrophic uh, APS, which is a very severe and basically um, life-threatening condition that will cause multi-organ thrombotic damage. In many patients of the ICU, and again, those uh, studies come from, um, from patients in China, they've seen that these patients, about 50 out of 59 patients in the ICU, they had antiphospholipid um, antibodies present. What is interesting that uh, patients were, that were pregnant or um, you know, young female, they did not increase, although they had the APL antibodies, did not increase the risk for miscarriages. Now, in patients with pre-existing conditions like ours, autoimmune rheumatic diseases, we were very afraid because uh, our conditions will increase the risk for infections and will also be under treatment that will immunosuppress the patients. So initially, if you remember, uh, we talked a lot about the benefit of, or they talked a lot about the benefit of using plaquenil or IL-6 inhibitor in an effort to immunomodulate their uh, immune system. But the studies that were done show that patients uh, that got, got this infection, only 17% of those people were patients with lupus. So not much, much more. We would have expected more in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, but I think the studies were skewed based on the population that they studied. What is very important to remember is that none of these studies had a very significant evidence that the fact that you carry an autoimmune rheumatic disease will increase your risk for this infection in particular, or, um, or the patients that were on biologics where we fear the most will have a worse outcome. So the fact that they had the disease or were on treatment, it doesn't seem to affect the outcome of these patients. As I mentioned before, um, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, drugs such as hydroxychloroquine, IL-6 inhibitors or IL-1 inhibitors, they were proposed to treat this hyperinflammatory state. However, although the studies in the beginning were very promising, when they look into larger population, especially here in the United States, hydrochloroquine did not show a robust evidence to provide protection, but there is, there is some sort of, um, you know, tendency to decrease the severity. Of course, people uh, were afraid about the QT prolongation, but the studies that were done later on did not show that um, those cohorts that use hydrochloroquine had an increased cardiac risk. When we came to IL-6 inhibitors, um, so again, the idea was to inhibit a pro-inflammatory cytokine, which is IL-6. At that point, um, you know, one study that we have uh, in China, not case reports, they saw that 15 out of those 20 patients that they receive um, IL-6 inhibitors, they had a decreased um, oxygen requirement and also a shorter hospitalization in uh, those severe cases. And um, a few cases uh, received IL-1 inhibitors, but those were moderate to severe. And you know that's, in, that's very impressive because 72% uh, out of those 16 patients apparently had a clinical improvement. But there are many studies that have to come. Now, what should we do about vaccine in these immunosuppressed patients? And I just looked the CDC guidelines, which were updated in December 29, 2020. And they said that <clears throat> immunosuppressed patients might be at increased risk for severe COVID, okay? But the vaccine has the potential to help them and uh, maybe the vaccine will not be or might not be very, F I mean, 100% protective um, because those people might not react, um, you know, as expected to the vaccine. They should receive the vaccine. Um, so their indication is that people with autoimmune conditions may receive the mRNA vaccine. And regarding safety, we don't have that data yet because those studies that were done uh, currently <clears throat> did not include patients with um, 
uh, autoimmune diseases. They were removed from the studies. Now, um, people that had a Guillain-Barre in the past, they also can receive the vaccine. And people, people that had the Bell palsy, although they saw some cases with the COVID, the mRNA COVID vaccine, they said that it's not enough to um, go against the vaccine on those uh, cases. But, you know, people ask me, what should I do after the vaccine? Should I wear a mask? Uh, uh, now I'm safe. What should I do? I think uh, the CDC uh, guidelines said that they should continue to do the same thing, to wear a mask, stay apart, six feet apart, and avoid the crowds. That was my uh, update. And I'm more than happy to answer your questions if I know to, to answer. <music>